Welcome to the Good Old Fashioned Masonic Podcast, where we drink old fashions, actually scotch, while we're talking about Masonic topics. So today's going to be a little bit of a change of pace. We're often uh, asked about, you know, we, we know about the, the folks that you're interviewing, but we right. really don't know much about you. Okay. So that said, the you today, Russ, will be you. Okay. So we're going to turn the tables a little bit, and uh, I'm going to interview Russ. Okay, so Russ, as we start out with any old-fashioned Masonic podcast, who is Russ the man? Okay. Well, um, I'll just tell a quick life story. I grew up in uh, Smolin, Kansas. Grew up on a dairy farm. Uh, graduated from Lindsberg High School. Um, that was a little Swedish community and uh, very Lutheran. So I grew up going to St. Lindsberg Lutheran Church, which uh, is a big twin tower church that sits up on a hill up in Slane County. Um, went off to Kansas State University. Um, got a degree in animal science. Um, I have been in some related field in um, ag industry for most of my career. So started with Associated Milk Producers. Um, went on to Mid-America Dairyman, which, of course, they formed DFA, worked for them. I left ag for a little bit and actually uh, sold human pharmaceuticals for about five years. So You sold humans human, or you sold human pharmaceuticals? Human pharmaceuticals. So, it, so not in ag. No, ve no veterinarian type stuff. No, yes. no. So cardiovascular products. Okay. Um, and then got into ag banking, and I've been in uh, ag banking for about uh, almost 15 and a half years. So okay. um, I have two grown children, um, Spencer. He's 28, and Miss Bailey is 25. Uh, Spencer lives in Kansas City, Missouri, and, and is uh, a data analytics specialist for a, a company there. And uh, Bailey works for Marriott down in uh, uh, Orlando, Florida, and uh, is in that whole corporate events deal. So um, I love uh, Freemasonry. I love to travel. And I love history, so I like to sort of put my travel and history together. And and uh, a couple have done a couple trips to Europe and uh, looking at World War II battlefields and that type of thing. You most recently had a trip over Memorial Day where you went to Normandy. I did with my daughter Bailey. Um, they actually held the Masonic, or not the Masonic, but the uh, Memorial Day service um, on Sunday morning. And we attended there at uh, the U.S. Cemetery there in Normandy, up on Colville Cliffs, right above Omaha Beach. And it was quite a moving experience. And um, walked on uh, um, Omaha Beach and um, Utah Beach and got to do some reflecting there. And, and it was uh, nice to at least have one of my kids there to to uh, experience that with. I remember one thing that you 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 told me when they were having the service as you were walking up you expected there to be just a ton of Americans and it yeah. was quite the opposite. Yeah. There was probably about I'm guessing 300 people there and I really did. I thought that there would be nothing but Americans, maybe a few Brits and a, and a, a few French uh, uh, people. Quite the opposite. 80% of the people at that service were French. Um, very, um, very few Brits and a few um, Americans. There was an American band, a military band, a French military band. But each community in the Normandy area had a representative there to put a wreath on uh, the memorial. And it took an hour, and a, it was an hour and a half long. And the last 30 minutes were French communities um, just memorializing um, U.S. war dead. Wow. Wow. So the next question after who Russ the Man is that we ask all of our guests is, walk us through your masonic journey from start to where you're at now okay um 
I grew up in a community that I always looked up to a group of men. Most of them were World War II veterans. My father was an older gentleman when uh, um, he got married, and he had me when he was 42, but he served during World War II. Um, all of his friends were veterans, and I just looked up to these guys hearing the different stories and uh, just a lot of history there. Um, and later, as I got older, realized that the majority of them were Freemasons. Um, my father was not. Um, later on, my uncle did become a Freemason, but that was um, I was in college by the time that happened. Uh, um, you know, there was a Shriner that always came to our school with uh, um, circus tickets uh, each and every year and sort of grew up knowing that these men um, existed. Um, Smolin is not very far from Salina where there was a big Masonic uh, building there and you drive by that and you sort of always wondered what, what was going on there. So um, I became a Mason. Um, in a one-day Blue Lodge class. Um, okay. So um, my brothers from back in home, Smolin and, and Lindsberg, um, I petitioned Lindsberg Lodge and became a member there. But it was a one-day Blue Lodge class, actually in McPherson Lodge. All three degrees, one All day. three deg degrees in one day. Uh, so eight to six? How many hours is this You know, span? I think it was probably like... It started at nine, and by three o'clock, it was okay. it was okay. over, and had a nice lunch, and and they did they did everything, and and did a pretty uh, good job. It was it. very well done, and okay. and um, they took the extra time to just walk through that, and and of course, um, I had uh, my friends from back in Lundsburg, older gentlemen that I really respected. Um, they were a part of the degree team, and and oversaw it, and and so I guess I didn't. Um, I didn't ever question it because there were lifelong members there of uh, the fraternity that were putting it on. And so I didn't see anything um, wrong with that. Okay. Um, but by then I already was living in Wichita. And so um, got sort of uh, acquainted with some different Masons and they invited me um, to, uh, uh, to the Scottish Rite for... Um, a ceremony there. So I joined the Scottish Rite in a two and a half day class. So did 10 of the degrees. Um, and that's where I met Hugh Gill IV. And he invited me to Albert Pike. And that sort of changed everything in my Masonic journey because uh, I got to be friends with so many of uh, the Masons um, around Wichita. And, and so um, I was asked to be during that era. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of players in the game. There were a lot. I of mean, it, players it, it was the who's, and I might argue that was the kind of the tail end of the who's who. But yeah. there was a who's who of yes members, and then your members, then your officers. These, these yeah. were leaders of the community. I yes, mean, it's very it, much so. Really, really crazy. Very much so. And when you went to lodge at Albert Pike, um, it was full. And, uh, you know, it was basically dark suits and, and there was an entire, um, entourage of past masters and, and they were the who's who. Um, when I jo joined, do you know what the nickname for Alper Pike was? Uh -huh. Shirt and Pike. Because Albert Pike was known that you come there, you're, 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 you're coming to lodge, you're taking it seriously. So shirt and Pike. You know, we've heard the Grand Lodge of Pike. There's been a lot, mm -hmm. lot, lot of other things. Yeah. But when you talked about everyone being suited up and, yeah. and looking a certain way, yeah. shirt and pike. Yeah, fairly. Uh, uh, and so um, I transferred my membership to Albert Pike um, when I was asked to be membership chairman. Um, and so there was, I got to know both the brothers uh, Talbots, um, both Bob and Merle. Um, and at that point in time, Albert Pike had a study club that met every week, and actually they held lodge just like regular state of meetings. There was an officer line. And there was right? an officer okay. line, and so you basically, there wasn't elections, you just were sort of stuck in, and, and every, I think every quarter, eight weeks, something, we just moved chairs, but you held that office and so it was the farm know, team wasn't it it was the it was, very much the farm team yeah it, it was, was the minor leagues as you're coming minor into pike. leagues of albert pike and uh and that way 
and uh, Jimmy Craig was a uh, study club coach. and He was ours, yeah. And uh, he didn't take no for an answer. So just, Shout out to you, Jimmy yeah, Craig. Very much so. Um, and so that's really where you uh, learn your work and, and uh, you progress through that. And um, I was asked to uh, uh, be a part of the officer line and, and uh, did that. And I was master in 2004. And uh, I was active uh, at the Scottish Rite on the stage crew uh, during that period of time, as well as uh, I was a member of the director staff in the uh, um, shrine. And so those were sort Scottish of Scottish Rite shrine. Did you join those fairly close to one another? Yeah. So the one and a half or the two and a half day class probably in April was uh, no. This was in February. Okay. That I did my Scottish Rite work, okay. and then there was a Cold Sands right at the very end. Oh, okay. And uh, did just the, the quick um, degree, and I was a Shriner. And, okay. and um, you know, we've, we've done several of these, and, and some people have asked or have stated disappointing things. The most disappointing thing was, at the end of that, the shrine, the, the shrine ceremony that I went through, then it was just done, and everybody went home. I right. sort of felt like, oh, like, I was just... Oh, this is it? Yeah, this right. is it. On the Monday or Tuesday right after that, um, a gentleman called and said, hey, um, there's a thing called, uh, um, oh, what was it called? Midian. Um, uh, the club. The, yeah. Club, uh, Midian, Midian. club Midian. Club Midian. There we go. Club Midian. And so for about four, um, I think it was once a month for four months, um, different units came in and there was a meeting and you got to sort of learn about the shrine. And, and so that got me. Um, actively involved, I, and it was that phone, that first phone call. Somebody took that someone, extra effort, and I think the gentleman was from Kingman, if I remember right. I, I, I can't remember. His so, thing. for those who don't know, Club Midian, Midian Shrine for for nobles that joined and didn't go right into a unit or yeah. club, Midian did a really great job of this. And we did membership. We sh- should have probably focused yeah. on that a little bit more, but the, we digress. But they would put you into Club Midian, mm-hmm. and they would have basically the other units and clubs, as Russ alluded to, come in and basically pimp what they do yeah. and, and try to solicit members yeah. that way. Is that, is that way I understood it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, several gentlemen uh, um, from the director staff just kept t- telling me that the director staff was sort of uh, it. And so that's, that's where I ended up. So nice. anyway, um, that's sort of where I've... Well... You left some things out, which we're going to talk about. So, yeah, who initially right. put you on the line at Pike? Um, Merle Talbot. Where, what position were you in? Um, I would have been there. I would have been junior steward, but someone dropped out right there at the. So I started as senior steward. A senior steward. Okay. Yeah, and then um, when I was junior deacon. Um, a senior officer passed, um, uh, Roger, um, uh, Skinner. And, uh, so I moved up. So I completed the officer line at, at Pike in five years. I have to cycle through mine. I think mine have been close. So, um, think through your master. Okay. 2004, think through your elected and appointed line, all through your line, top to bottom, Tyler did all all of your officers go on to be a master of a lodge? No. Okay. Okay. Who, who, the two behind you were, who was five and six? Who was your junior and senior uh, wardens? Uh, Mike Rousey and Bob Wadron. Okay, they both went on to be masters. Perfect. And who's your senior deacon? Uh, Sheldon Lawrence. Sheldon Lawrence. That's yes. Sheldon Shout out to Sheldon. Very much so. Sheldon is the man. We're going we're gonna to talk to Sheldon later. Sheldon was a great mentor. So um, so you're not prepared for this one, but I'm going to no. remind you, I think. I think we talked years ago because you were a mentor as I was coming up to be Master of Pike. <laughs> you had a ritual that you did, maybe not all the time, but before your lodge meeting, mm-hmm. what did you do? do so at the time our pike met in um the scottish rite in the, in that building or that that um lodge hall is quite stately and i had the flexibility with my 
job that I could get off fairly early and I actually went to the lodge and sometimes I was the only one there or sometimes um, Scott Kaler, the secretary, was there. But I would go in and I would prep myself and I would sit in the master's chair in that room by myself and I would cycle through what was on the agenda, what the topics that I had heard, I thought maybe somebody might bring up and would go through anything from balloting to if there was a motion, what would I do, how do I do it, and just mentally prepared myself so I never was ever surprised um, sitting in the East. So obviously I knew that, um, and I think this is a very important part that anybody coming up through any sort of leadership line to do that, that, that was one of the, the great tidbits that I got from you. I did the same thing, um, just kind of anticipating different things that could happen. And then if I thought something may be imminent, I would have uh, either stewards ready or deacons ready or my wardens ready right. to to do some things. So I just, that, that was one of the things that stuck with me. Yeah. I don't even know if you remember us talking oh, about that. that uh, was, yeah. That was such a yeah. cool thing. The other thing, and... and uh, um, Brother Mike Kelly that we talked to in a, a previous um, episode, um, we were just chit-chatting, and I don't even know it was on his episode, but it was about um, knowing bylaws. And, and I, I did a pretty good job of knowing the bylaws. And if I knew something was going to come up, even talk with the secretary and just research it before, just know, have a pulse of what might be going on in your lodge, so then when it happens in Lodge, you're not scrambling or have to figure it out. You need to know it beforehand. And, and that, yeah. and that, again, we talk about the major players. You know, that past master um, lineup um, was pretty impressive sitting over there. And you didn't, I didn't really ever want to screw up in front of them. Right. Well, and I lot, did lots all of other. Right, right. <laughs> that's, that's just what you do. So um, kind of talk about knowing bylaws and in... When you were master, it, there was a need at that time to move from our home then mm -hmm. to another home for essentially financial reasons. For financial reasons, yes. So at the 50,000 foot view, you don't have to go into a lot of detail. Um, was that a, When you had to call for that vote, was that a packed lodge room? Was that the most you'd ever seen at a meeting? It wasn't the most that I'd seen at a meeting, but it was it was packed. Um, and it was it was something that had been um, teed up. It, it had been coming for a long time, and finally, it happened on my year that the vote happened to to move out of the Scottish Rite and 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 basically revamp the way we did business as well as our Masonic business because um, we had been running pretty hot and we had a large membership, but. Um, dues weren't keeping up and we were spending more. We were spending a lot more than we ever brought in. And uh, on we, a lot of, for a lot of different things, it wasn't just building, but no, it there, was, there were I, like elaborate gifts for past masters. Yeah, and yes. just a, a, yeah yes. we, we back when the membership was large enough, there was cash flow to do things like that. All of a sudden, it just didn't. And we, we had a paid secretary and we had lots of things. And so, um, through that time, there was basically, from the time I got onto the line, that was sort of building up. Um, s several of the trustees had moved on. Younger, newer trustees moved in. The officer line took more of a ownership of their fiduciary responsibilities. There was a lot of things moving and going at the same time, and there were a lot of men responsible for um, you know, getting Albert Pike back into a financially sound position to where then we could make Masons and do what we were supposed to be doing. Well, I th really think that that was uh, essential to where we are now financially with Albert Pike, our, our, uh, how positive we are. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I think that you, you could essentially had the world's largest lodge damn near go bankrupt. If yeah, we, we were within a year or two from that. 
So think that through. Folks that have done some research on Albert Pike, just think of that move and how hard it must have been, but where it, where it led us. So when you're when you're making moves in the best interest of of your lodge and not yourself, that's, those are just some tough decisions that have to be made, right? So, yeah. um, what was your single most? And it's probably that. What was your, would that have been your single most challenging task as a master to to make that uh, vote for the move? Yeah. So. Throughout, um, you know, my junior ward and senior ward and year, it, it became obvious that we needed to make some changes um, um, within several of the officer structure. Um, and we had had a longtime secretary that, that uh, um, seemed to, that there was time um, for a change. So between the the vote on moving as well as, um, you know, uh, making a change, making a change. Um, those were some hard, hard, hard things. And, and, you know, I think, um, we tried to do the best we could, but, um, at the time I, I was only 35 and, um, and I think that helped in the fact that I could get it done. Um, but two, you know, today, the age I am, I'm not quite sure that I would actually do what I did then. Yeah. Because yeah. Um, it, it, it took a toll yeah. on. Uh, you can be a little more, I think we're a little more ruthless when we're younger. And as yeah. we get older, the maturity, we kind of think things through a different right, way. Right. Yeah. I, I, does it make us a little more scared? I don't know if scared's the right. Term, no, but... I think um, blind courage sometimes. Fair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't know what you don't know. You don't. That's that's true. So I was more black and white then too. So. Yeah, I think you're still pretty black and white. I don't think you're black and white. No, no. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. So, what is your single most prized Masonic anything? I mean, it could be a, a ring, a necklace, a certificate. Is there one thing your single most just like this is the thing I want everyone to see? You know, um, probably just the plaque that I was master of Albert Pike Lodge. Um, I'm very proud of serving the craft, um, and I enjoyed that very much. And so uh, the plaque that I was given, um, you know, towards the end, yeah, that's probably it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, yeah. yeah. So uh, what master at Pike, since you've been in, do you think move the needle at the lodge the most and why? You know, that I, that's hard because um, I think there's been several that have done a lot of good. And, and, um, we'll walk through it that way then. And so, you know, Dan Hawkins was... A trustee at the time when we were needing to make some hard decisions and he really took the ball and ran with it um he he led that um he was at the right place at the right time to help make those decisions um and he helped me a lot when it came to um working through um the financial piece of albert pike um bob talbot um, is one of the, you know, in our lifetime, a grandmaster from Ivor Pike, a uh, dear friend of mine. And, and just the amount of time that we've debated and talked over lunches and over a cocktail about Freemasonry in Albert Pike in Kansas, um, he moves the needle. Um, I don't know that I've ever sat in a lodge where I've enjoyed it more than when you were master. And um, I just en I just enjoyed it. You, you had a positive a positive uh, viewpoint and you you led that that lodge and and I always appreciated that of you too. Yeah, I think I got the, some of that vibe from from Doc Rensner and, and Sheldon. That was some of the you yeah, know, I watched yeah. Doc in action and got some feedback from Sheldon. so that, that's uh, that's good. Yeah. So let's go into the shrine. So when you first came in, you're pretty active in the director staff. Mm -hmm. um, what did you do for them, and then why did you slow down okay. there? So, um, like I said earlier, I was uh, 
master of Albert Pike when I was 35. My kids were very young then, and, mm-hmm. and by that point in time, it was time to just slow down my Masonic journey at that time. So I ran fairly hot in the Scottish Rite and the Shrine and the director staff and Albert Pike all at the same time. They were all meeting down in that area. They all they all fed off each other, and it was important to be part of all three at the same time at that point in time. Um, but my kids were young, and they were getting older, and I needed to go to games, and I needed to be at swim meets, and, and I needed to be a dad. And so my Masonic uh, journey sort of just... Um, was put on hold. Paused. Just, just paused. Um, I would I would go to lodge every once in a while, and and uh, I would, but yeah, it wasn't first in my life. So my family is always first, and 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 um, it also allowed me to do some other things, even in in my church. And so um, it just was a time in my life where I needed to do other things. Makes sense. It's fair. So uh, you did a stint on the appointed side of the divan at Midian. Mm-hmm. What did you think about that? That was kind of your first introduction to being on that. I, I, we might have similar opinions, so I'm, 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 I'm anxious right. to see. Right. You know, um, because of my activities um, previously, I think um, when I came back, when my kids were, had graduated from college and moved away, um, had some more free time. And so I just started injecting myself back into the shrine a little bit. And, and, uh, um, I was second ceremonial master and, uh, and served with you and and others on that line. You know, it was my first opportunity. Um, I don't know that it's something that, uh, is something that is really down my daily wick. I enjoyed it. Um, there were things that I liked and enjoyed and Certain things I didn't. Um, so, yeah, I, it, it was a good year. I'm going to assume, let me, let, me, let me speak for you. Correct me where I'm wrong. Meetings are meetings, whatever, but the liaison assignments are what's cool. Oh, yeah. So I was uh, liaison to the um, horse patrol, um, to a group of people that I didn't really know, and I thoroughly enjoyed them. Um, um, uh, to the, uh, <laughs> Dodge City Shrine Club, where a bunch of our friends from Lewis are. The Lewis and, Mafia. Yeah. The, the Lewis, Lewis Mafia. Mafia. And, uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. And, uh, then the Ambassadors. And that is a, a unit that, uh, club that I've now joined. And I find fascinating. A, a group of, you know, I'd, it's getting younger. It was a group of older couples that, you know, had been active and, and been doing things in the shrine for a long time. And, and now they just uh, enjoy themselves once a month and go to nice restaurants and just enjoy each other. And I, I like that. Yeah, that's a, a you turn me on to that group. Yeah. Love it. And it's fascinating. At any given time, that ambassador's meeting call can have more people than a stated meeting at meeting. It's fascinating. Yes. It's it's always good food. It's always great company. Yeah. Uh, it's it's. I think it's one of just those uh, those gyms that people just don't know about. Yeah, exactly. So, which which is cool. I think that's what makes it so good. Still, yes, so, very much so. Uh, any newer masons out there that you're excited about that you're keeping your eye on? You're like, man, this this person has the it factor. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there are some. Uh, guys at Albert Pike that, that impressed me, you know, um, and they've been mentioned already. Some, uh, Dave Thomas, uh, Matt Cook for sure. Um, Garth Bloom is going to be master this coming year. Um, those guys move the needle. I really, I think so. Um, you know, and of course I'd, everybody's uh, kicking in Jim Holmberg. Jim Holmberg's impressive. I, he, he is a man. Once you get to know him, um, he's a man of few words, but if he's talking, then you better be listening. Yeah. And, uh, he's impressive. Yeah. Um, and, Grand Lodge of Kansas. We messed up. We should have snatched him up. So, uh, keep an eye on him for a long time. He can move the needle. Yeah, very much so. So, um, magic wand. So this is the magic wand question that we ask everyone before we get obviously into the most important question of the day. Magic wand. 
if you had a magic wand, what would be what would you want that magic wand to be able to do and say, boom, it fixes this in masonry? <laughs> As a one day blue lodge mason. Okay. I wish I could influence the Grand Lodge of Kansas to have more than one tool chest to grab a tool out of from time to time when it comes to membership. Um, I am a one day Mason. I, while I was master conducted and was a part of all the way in one day classes to where you were, a, became a, a Blue Lodge Mason, Scottish Rite Mason, Shriner in, in one day. Um, to there is a combination of things that make masons and when we get caught too far in the past with too much tradition versus actually looking at society today and seeing what is actually needed um, without losing the tradition there is a compromise there somewhere and 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 uh, um, but to just say, no, that's horrible, um, you know, quite frankly, um, uh, the most recent uh, grandmaster of uh, Kansas, uh, Stoops, um, wrote an article and, and talked about the numbers, uh, whether you're in a one-day Blue Lodge class um, or traditionally. And, and uh, you know, his, his data was fairly, it wasn't data was data. The Overall data said that we as Masons do a piss poor job of making Masons. And I think currently Masonry is at a turning point where we truly need to reevaluate some things. Um, just because we've done it in the past doesn't mean that we should continue to do it. And that for some Masons, that's just, you know, sacrilegious. And, and I think um, we've got to we've got to do some different things. Fair, fair. Whew, that got deep. <laughs> All right, so the most, Light it up. Light the it up. most important question of the podcast. You'll see up on your screen, one of these has to go. And actually, I've made it way too easy for Russ, I think. You have the four sports. You've got basketball, football, golf, and soccer. Mm-hmm. One of them have to go forever. It was never invented. I could care less. What would it be and why? It would be basketball. That it would go forever? That it would be gone forever. Not what I thought. I thought you'd say soccer. Whoa, whoa. Well, just because, you know, I, I beat you in horse. It's true you know, story. Yeah, true, true story. story. True because story. he thought uh, fat boy over here couldn't play. Um, Hold on, play and horse are two different games. Now I was, I was. There, there was also a, 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 a an actual game that happened, and that didn't go, that didn't go well for Mister Brown. But yeah, horse, whatever, horse, whatever. the lefty, yeah. the lefty caused me problems. Of course, <laughs> it was not good. It was not good for basketball. Really? Yeah, I, professional basketball. I think. Needs oh to no! Just forget be professional basketball. Basketball well, in I, general. So, this is a hard thing. So, so I like to watch football. You like to watch soccer? I don't mind soccer. You would watch soccer over a Wichita State basketball game? Yes. Oh my god. I would have lost a lot of money on this one. I would have lost I feel I don't even know you, Russ Brown. I don't even know who this yeah. guy is anymore. Yeah. So well, all of that said, thank you for watching uh, this episode of the good old fashioned Masonic Podcast. Thank you. Cheers.